future. I would invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now. And when the First Minister is ready, I would invite the First Minister to speak for uh, 13 minutes, an exact 13 minutes, if you please, First Minister. <laughs> I'll uh, abide by your strictures, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. As I was mentioning to the Parliament uh, earlier on, uh, I've just come back from launching the uh, Scotland's Climate Justice Fund with the uh, former Irish President May Robinson. Uh, the Scottish uh, Government is providing some £3 million for the fund. Uh, I know because of the debate on the, the 1st of March that this is an initiative which is supported unanimously uh, across this Parliament. Therefore, it's interesting, thinking for a second, about how we came to be in charge as a Parliament uh, of climate change and, and now of climate justice. As I understand the position, in 1997, when the rules for, uh, were drawn up for the, the Devolution Act, the Scotland Act, it specified what areas uh, were to be reserved. At that stage, climate change wasn't regarded on anyone's radar as one of the key issues, and therefore it wasn't specified in the legislation, and therefore it wasn't reserved. And as a result, one of the most important issues in a planetary scale was devolved to this Parliament. Now, this Parliament has taken forward that responsibility incredibly well. We unanimously passed as a Parliament the climate change targets, and we are one of the few Parliaments in the world which has managed to do that. This year, we have gone further uh, and established a pioneering climate change fund to have some equity in terms of the distribution of the impact of climate justice. So that is something which I think every single party and every single parliamentarian can take pride of. The question I would ask is this. If this Parliament can seize the initiative on one of the most profound environmental, economic and moral issues this world faces, is it not ridiculous that we can't take decisions on full taxation, defence or welfare spending? <laughs> Deputy Presiding Officer, when this Parliament was uh, met on the 12th of May 1999, Winnie Ewing famously reconvened the first session of the Scottish Parliament after 292 years in abeyance. That day was a, a milestone in Scotland's journey. I think the motion before us today marks another. Because today, for the first time since the beginning of the political union, the elected representatives of the Scottish people gathered here today in this parliament will be asked by a Scottish government to agree that Scotland should become an independent country. An independent country that will stand alongside the other nations of these islands in a situation of equality. Now, today, the members of this parliament will be heard as the elected representatives of the people of Scotland, the people who know most and care most, by definition, about our country. The people who are best placed to determine the nation's future are the people of Scotland. I believe this parliament has achieved a great deal in its short lifespan. Uh, the smoking ban, the world leading climate change act, the new legislation to help tackle Scotland's relationship with alcohol, these are just few of uh, many, many advances. But this Parliament is not yet able to make many of the key de decisions which affect the lives of our fellow countrymen and women. Since devolution, we as a Parliament, we as a people, have shown we can make a success of running our own health service, our schools, our local government, our police, our courts and much else besides. Indeed, Dennis Canavan has made this very point. Uh, drawing on 26 years as a Member of Parliament at Westminster, a further eight years as a Member of this Parliament, a substantial, vast experience across two parliaments, and that has now led him to the conclusion as a convert that Scotland's future lies as an independent nation. The point is, presiding officer, if we are capable of doing all these things responsibly, successfully for ourselves, why on earth should we not run our economy, our pensions and represent ourselves in the world stage? And why shouldn't we be able to make the decision to rid Scotland of the obscenity of nuclear weapons? Yeah. Willie Rennie. Given way. If he's given this Parliament the choice today, the decision today, why is he not trusting the people of Scotland with the decision today? First Minister. Willie Rennie is uh, out of date. His coalition partners, led by the Prime Minister, said he's not fussed about the date ah. of the referendum. It's now been accepted by all parties. 
that it's going to be in the autumn of 2014. So all that huffing and puffing over the last year didn't mean anything at all. It was a fake argument from a fake parliament in Westminster. And unlike Willie Rennie, I do trust the people of Scotland with these decisions. I know they'll make better choices for Scotland as a Western Westminster government could at any given time on any given day. Now, last week, the Scottish National Party and the Labour Party, representing nearly three quarters of the electorate, voted together in this Parliament to attempt to, to mitigate the consequences of Westminster's misguided and damaging welfare reform programme. The key word for John Lamont. Now doing, and regret advising people in England to vote Liberal. No. First Minister. <laughs> Listen, I, I, I think, I, I think of, of all the people who have regrets about the Liberal Democrats, I think there are thousands of uh, erstwhile supporters who will be up there rather more than me. But I think Joanne Lamont should maybe issue her regrets about being hand in glove Absolutely. with the Tory party at the present moment. We know she wasn't at the meeting because it was six men at the Alistair Darling meeting. But we do know her deputy was there, yes. representatives of the Labour Party and the Conservative Party, in cahoots against the wishes of the people of Scotland. Well, I was saying before I was so fortunately interrupted. <laughs> The key word, presiding officer, as far as the welfare reform is concerned, is mitigate. And the question for all of us, why should we be limited to mitigating, to lessening the impact of these Westminster policies on thousands of families across our nation? The opposition to this motion today would have a stand back and say, that's all we can do. I say far better if this parliament had the power to stop the Tory dismantling of the welfare state. There's a message and a clear vision. Westminster continues to spend billions on weapons which could destroy the world. Scotland should spend on social provision which could be the envy of the world. Now, last Friday, the co-convener of the Scottish Green Party, Patrick Harvey, and I took part in the launch of Yes Scotland. It's going to be the largest community-led campaign ever mobilised in this country. Already 15,000 people are backing the Yes Scotland declaration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Over 3,000 yeah. volunteers signed up to support yeah, yeah, yeah. the campaign. Yeah. I give way to a party which may or may not have 3,000 members left. <laughs> Ruth Davidson. I wonder if he counts amongst the, his number my deputy, all the political editors of Scotland and everyone else whose Twitter pick was harvested and used in support. And you need to see that against their wishes in order to further that. First Minister. No, we've managed to extract you all from the website. Hey. We've taken out Donald Duck, Osama bin Laden, Joanne Lamont. They've all been taken out of the website. Now I have to say, I think there's a bit of envy going on here. I have been looking at the followers in various people's positions and for tweeting. This is the Twitter followers at the latest count as of this morning. And the First Minister, that's me. <laughs> 20,490. Willie Rennie, the only poll the Liberals come second in in the whole of Scotland. <laughs> 2,405. Joanne Lamont, 2,383. Oh. Ruth Davidson, <laughs> 1,988. Oh. Now, can I just say to the Conservative Party leader, my advice is to tweet more interestingly. Yeah. <laughs> tweet more interestingly and you'll get more followers if you try very hard indeed. The range of support is impressive. Brian Scott is supporting an independent Scotland, even though he's from a Labour background. And Friday spoke powerfully of his own political journey. No, thank you. Tommy Brennan. Well, listen, 
I've taken three interventions thus far. I'm not sure that the, the member's intervention would be any better than the first three. He spoke powerfully of his political journey. Tommy Brennan, one of Scotland's greatest ever yes. trade union leaders, yes. is backing independence. Well, I don't know if that laugh was for Tommy Brennan, but in my opinion he did more for Scottish industry than any member Order. sitting on the Labour benches. Paul Leslie, a former Conservative councillor, is supporting independence, and most people around that way are former Conservative councillors, so I understand. Peter Dodge, a crofter, Jewel McElroy, a disability campaigner, Tasmina Al Sheikh, chair of the Scottish Asian Women's Association. What unites all of these people across society is common cause and shared purpose. We believe that the people who care most about Scotland, that is the people of Scotland, should be in charge of the nation's future. No one, but no one, will do as good a job for our country than the people of Scotland themselves. That's why being independent will enable our country to make the progress it needs to. We can realise the potential and build a nation that is fairer, greener and more successful than we are today. The timetable has been laid out. Next year, the Scottish Government will publish a white paper setting out the detail of the independence prospectus. It will present the Government's case for independence, the starting point for the nation. How will be governed? It will be a prospectus that is put before the people in 2014. That prospectus will be a single chamber parliament, a first minister and a cabinet selected by parliament as today. Elections using the same system of proportional representation, local government with the same powers and responsibility. A high court, a court of session that resume their historic roles as the Supreme Courts of Scotland. It will set out Scotland as a member of the European Union, the Queen as our head of state, and yes, sterling as our currency. On the first day as an independent country, that is how Scotland will be. Presenting officer, I remember campaigning with the Labour Party, not with the Tories, but with yeah. the Labour Party in the devolution a referendum. And we made it very clear the job of the referendum was to specify the nature of the devolved parliament. Then it was up to the people to decide which party ran that devolved parliament. So once we set the structure of the state, then the people of Scotland will decide whether they want a social democratic Scotland with the SNP, a socialist Scotland, perhaps not with the Labour Party, but people will put forward that position, a green Scotland, a free enterprise Scotland, or whatever combination of policies the Scottish people so choose. For all of us, the single most important question to ask ourselves in representing our people is, is it not an essential truth that the people best placed to run this country are the people of Scotland ourselves? And if we lead this nation as a parliament should, speak out with clear voice today, then we can be better placed to build a Scotland that transcends the experience of this Parliament and betters the lives of every man, woman and child in Scotland. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call on Joanne Lamont. Nine minutes, please. Order. I've never thought that the First Minister had self-esteem issues, but I have to say to you that reading out the number of followers you've got on Twitter to prove how good you are is a whole new level of anxiety, I think, for the First Minister. And the First Minister started by talking about climate change and the importance of us working together on climate change. I think the message of that is that in the world we now live in, the more we cooperate, the more we come together to identify the key problems and act on them, so much the better, rather than making our prospectus one of separation. And another issue the First Minister raises about the question of the reconvened Scottish Parliament. This is not a reconvened Scottish Parliament. This is the first Scottish Parliament elected under universal suffrage, which allows women as well as men to be here, and it's not an exclusive club, an exclusive club 
for the landed gentry in Scotland and it says everything about the First Minister that he manages there's any connection between that Parliament and this body created to make a difference to the lives of people. The fact of the matter, of course, as someone who passionately believes that sovereignty lies with the Scottish people, I also believe we have an independence that doesn't need the First Minister to be given a new title to prove it. We as a nation were never conquered. The United Kingdom has not been imposed upon us. It is the choice of Scots. It is the choice of Scots to share power with our neighbours on these small islands that we are stronger together. Indeed, had Scotland been a separate country right now, I believe we would be seriously looking at creating the type of union we currently enjoy, the type of social, economic and political union that has brought us 300 years of peace and stability, the type of union that allows us to weather the worst economic crisis of our lifetime when the banking sector collapsed. And without Scotland, I believe the United Kingdom would cease to exist because we built the United Kingdom with our neighbours. Order, order. MacDonald. I, th I thank Ms Lambert very much for letting me in. I wonder if we could start as we mean to go on and have facts. Although Winnie Ewing did say that this was the Scottish Parliament continuing and Joanne, takes, uh, Joanne Lambert takes issue with that, the Speaker of the House of Commons has also ruled that that is the English Parliament of Simon de Montfort continuing and it's a very much changed place. So Parliaments do evolve. Here, here. Esoteric point. Thank you very much. I was actually Joanne making Lamb. a more important point, which is that this Parliament, a new, modern, thriving building and place where the people's priorities are decided, is what we should celebrate rather than misrepresenting what the last Parliament was about. Now, as I was saying, the Without Scotland, I believe the United Kingdom would cease to exist because we built the United Kingdom with our neighbours. And that is why I disagree with the First Minister when he says we are subtly lodgers in the UK. He may be subtly, but you can't be a lodger in a house you built yourself. Now, there are two reasons, I believe, why the First Minister's campaign to separate Scotland from our neighbours has stalled. Two self-evident truths. One, it's not what most Scots, Scots want. Two... It was not all he was elected to do. When he whispered in the last days of the election campaign that he would hold a referendum in the second half of the Parliament, I believe he did so to reassure voters that separation wouldn't be the issue which would dominate this Parliament because he knew that is not what most Scots want. But dominate proceedings it has. What he failed to say was that he would spend the first half of the, of the Parliament not governing Scotland, but trying to sell as a bill of goods the majority of us do not want. It means days, weeks, months and now years of endless debates over currency unions, NATO, EU membership and oil prices, campaign launches and relaunches, declarations and registers. And today, yet again, a debate on separation. This government's single obsession, their one and only prescription for all our lives. The eternal answer, no matter what the question. I know I raised it First Minister's questions because I was optimistic I might get an answer. I self-evidently did not. The debate is entitled Scotland's Future. Andrew Harvey. I'm grateful to Joanne Lamont for giving way. Earlier today at FMQ's, I think she did raise serious questions which are in need of serious answers. And I wish she would stick to that kind of issue. When will the Labour Party get over the fact that the referendum is going to happen and the mandate for it exists? Joanne Lambert. I absolutely accept that. But I also say to Patrick Harvey that while we conduct that debate, we should also be getting on with the business of challenging the key issues of the day. We know, we know that across, across the portfolio areas, everything is on pause until we have a referendum. That is a problem. I want to ask, I want to debate. John Swinney. 
I am grateful to John Lambert for giving way. If she reflects on her contribution to the debate yesterday, where she had an opportunity to give a constructive solution or suggestion about issues that matter to the people of Scotland today on the Eurozone, there was not one single suggestion came in the whole 11 minutes of her speech yesterday. Simply not true, and I suggest you look at what I said. Order! Enough! We need a plan for business. We need to be working and talking to the banks. We need to stop cutting housing. We need to invest in the further education sector. All of these things we need to do. But the problem with the Scottish Government, instead of understanding the real debate that we should be engaged in, we continue with them trading in assertion, not fact, ambiguity, not precision, and instead of a national vision, there will be an attempt to entice us all into a communal hallucination. Our vision for the future of Scotland starts with a vision of social justice, a Scotland where everyone can realise the potential, where we have individual rights and collective responsibilities, one where the qualities of industry and community are interdependent, not mutually exclusive. It starts with a vision and then asks what machinery, political, social, economic, we need to achieve it. The starting point is not a border drawn in a map. Social justice does not have a flag. Equality does not need a passport. We ask, what kind of world do we want to build? And then ask, what tools do we need to build it? The nationalists judge their strength. I think I've taken enough for the moment. The nationalists judge their strength by the tools they have, not the quality of what they can build. The SNP's case for leaving the United Kingdom has changed over the years. Now, policies do change for all political parties, but the fact is they cannot build a logical case for Scotland leaving the United Kingdom because the foundation of their argument is blind faith. And we are often in this country people of great sentiment, but too many families know they cannot feed their children's sentiment. You can't resource a school or university or hospital solely on blind faith. That the best choices for our future are rational, logical, rooted in reality. What does the SNP say about the currency of a separate Scotland? The pound, it appears, no. It's no longer a millstone around our neck, as it was just a few years ago, but now the currency of choice. So will we retain it? The First Minister says we'll be welcomed because of our contribution to the rest of the United Kingdom's balance of payments. But he has not discussed that with the Bank of England. The Deputy First Minister says we'll have representative on the Monetary Policy Committee, but they've not discussed that either. The First Minister says that the Bank of England will have a separate Scotland as a bank of last resort. He's not discussed that with the Governor of the Bank of England either. He is claiming a certainty for the people of Scotland that he has simply not established. Indeed, he is happy to take Great, Scotland. You draw to a close, please. He is happy to take Scotland on a leap of faith, knowing that he does not have the answers to these questions. The fact of the matter is, we have a vision for Scotland where we do stand. Where we do stand. Order. I believe we stand taller as part of the United Kingdom, a partnership where we share risks and rewards, a platform on which we can build the just and fair society which we all want Scotland to be. I move the amendment in my name. Very thanks. Order. Order. I now call on Ruth Davidson an exact six minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to congratulate the First Minister for the tone he struck uh, with his debate today. Uh, I think if we're measuring followers, he might like to know that more people were in the gallery for the education questions and for this historic motion. Uh, now, at some point over the next two and a half years, Scotland will be asked to choose. It will be a decision which determines not only the standard of living that we enjoy, but the standard of living of our children, our grandchildren, and of generations to come. And once that decision is made, if it is to separate from the rest of the United Kingdom, then that decision is forever. There's no turning back, there's no change of mind, there's no reversal at the ballot box in five years' time. England, Wales and Northern Ireland would go one way and Scotland would go another. Now, given the fundamental nature of the question and the monumental effects that a vote to separate Scotland from the rest of the United Kingdom would have, 
The very least that we should be able to expect is a clear articulation by the proponents of separation of what they actually mean by independence and what a separate Scotland would really look like. In fact, probably the most remarkable thing about the debate over Scotland's future is the unwillingness, or perhaps even the inability, of the SNP to define exactly what they mean by independence, or any indication, as exemplified by the First Minister's performance at lunchtime, of any preparatory work having been undertaken at all to check that their assertions are even possible. On the one hand, they argue that independence, separating from England, Wales and Northern Ireland, would transform Scotland, but on the other, they argue that very little would actually change. Sterling as our currency, continued membership of the European Union, the Queen as our head of state. Well, let's deal with some of the issues that have been raised in this debate and let's deal in fact. Because a newly separate Scotland with a large fiscal deficit and saddled with significant public debt would face not only, would face not only the loss of its AAA credit rating, but be left with a choice between increased borrowing costs or... Yeah, absolutely, I'll give away. The member mentioned the fiscal deficit, the large fiscal deficit that Scotland will have. Would she agree that it will be in exactly the same proportion as the fiscal deficit that the rest of the UK will have after independence? Ruth Davison. But even allowing for the SNP government's definition of the geographical share of North Sea oil, Scotland faces an overall fiscal deficit of £10.7 billion in the last financial year. Senior economists predict the position will worsen next year because of oil revenues. And if you add the worsening fiscal deficit, that the, and this is where we get onto the UK, that the 80 billion share of the UK's net public debt in independent Scotland would be obliged to assume, then the economic reality becomes pretty clear. So what we would see, a choice between, I'll make progress, thank you, we'll be left with a choice between increased borrowing costs or rapidly reducing our debt level through deeper cuts in public spending. So it's higher mortgage rates, higher personal taxes, cuts to public monies. And then, there is, and then there is the fundamental matter on currency, at which point I will gladly give way to the First Minister. First Minister. And, and, and I know that, uh, that uh, Ruth Davidson will have read the, the, the girls' report for 2010-11, and she's quite right. When the high recession, the Scotland had a minus 7.4% uh, deficit as percent of GDP. The UK one was 9.2%. In other words, if we were borrowing at the same rate as the United Kingdom, we'd have £2.6 billion either to borrow less or to spend more. Uh, I'm sure that Ruth has seen the girl's statement. I'm sure she agrees with the figures, since she wanted some facts. Yeah, yeah. Ruth Davison, two I'm sure minutes the left. First Minister will agree that a newly separate Scotland without the size, strength and history of credit rating of a UK would not keep its AAA credit rating. To the currency because after the First Minister's long flirtation with the Euro, even he has been forced to admit that it would be a disaster for Scotland. So the solution is to keep sterling and the Bank of England as the lender of last resort. But if it was to be the lender of last resort, what remained of the UK would need to oversee Scotland's fiscal management. And if an independent Scotland were to submit to such control over its monetary and fiscal policy, what kind of independence is that? More confusion, more risk and more needless uncertainty. Now this is not a future that I want for my country because Scotland deserves better. I love my country. My country is Scotland and I bow to nobody in my commitment to Scotland and the well-being of our people. But like most Scots, my pride in my country and my sense of patriotism is not threatened by the British component of my identity. Far from it. Like the majority of Scots, I celebrate and I draw strength from it. Because amongst the greatest strengths of the United Kingdom is the diversity of its cultures. And that is reflected here in Scotland. Asian Scots, French Scots, Italian Scots, German Scots. But the one thing that you can't be in the SNP's vision of the future is a British Scot. And this debate is about the future. It's about my family's future, the future of everyone else's family. So if we imagine for one moment that Scotland had not been a partner in the United Kingdom for the past 300 years, but now had the chance to join it, 
The trading opportunities and access to international markets gained by membership of the United Kingdom, the jobs and investment secured by those opportunities, the advantages of an integrated economy, the ability to weather the economic storms that have devastated small countries, the clout on the international stage offered by membership of the G8, standing shoulder to shoulder with our allies as part of the most successful military alliance in the world. Order. Safety and security through an integrated defence force, backed by special forces with security services like MI5, MI6, the envy of other nations. Order. Who but the most starry-eyed of nationalists would deliberately not choose Order. these advantages? Ms. Davidson, you must conclude, please. Okay. But these are precisely the advantages that the First Minister and his government are calling on the Scottish people to surrender. This debate is about the future. We are stronger together than apart. We have massive achievements to our name as the United Kingdom and a future that is positive through working together, pooling our resources and sharing our rewards. Sorry, I want I the next generation to inherit a more prosperous, confident Scotland and that's why I must support the amendment in the name of Joanne Lamont. <laughs> If the Chamber would allow me to inform them that this debate is heavily oversubscribed. Could I have some order, please? This debate is heavily oversubscribed, and I have to remind members to keep their speeches to strictly to their allotted times. And I also give warning that it might then even be necessary to curtail the length of speeches towards the end of the debate. I call Linda Fabiani to be followed by Lewis MacDonald. Speeches of a maximum six minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's a privilege to be able to stand up in this chamber and debate the future of Scotland. This is our national parliament and relevant to everyone in our nation. And what an opportunity we have, the biggest opportunity in 300 years, to regain our sovereignty and improve the lives of those we serve. That's why we need and why we want independence, so that Scotland can continue to grow and develop as a nation and as a society, with decisions taken in Scotland by those who live here. It's obvious to me uh, that this would be in our own best interest, but also in the interest of the wider world. The choice for Scotland is quite clear. We can choose to remain a bit player through the United Kingdom, unable to advance our own interests, let alone influence the international agenda, or alternatively, as an independent country, we can take responsibility for our own actions at home and abroad. For example, we can say, not in our name, and we can truly mean it. That's hugely important to me. <laughs> Members of the Yes campaign may have differing views on how Scotland will develop in the years ahead, but what we all do have in common is that we trust the people of Scotland to deliver a better outcome than we have at present. And let's be clear, the choice facing Scotland is the exciting opportunity of independence or it's the status quo. That's right. So I hope to hear today from those who argue the case for staying in the UK a positive view and justification for entrusting Scotland's future well-being to the Westminster Parliament and maintaining that status quo. A status quo that's hardly positive when one considers the UK's current economic situation and the draconian cuts that have been forced on us nationally and communally and individually. The ability of a people to shape the ethics of their own democratic society is a precious right and responsibility. When Joanne Lamont commented on child poverty earlier this year, she said she wanted to see it tackled elsewhere in the UK as well as in Glasgow. I also want to see child poverty tackled in Liverpool and Manchester and elsewhere in the UK. I also want to see it tackled in Lagos and Mumbai. <laughs> there is no excuse for continuing lack of action here in Scotland. So Scotland should have the power to act on child poverty. Perhaps representatives here today of the Labour Party in Scotland will tell us why they... No, thank you why they prefer to see this power controlled by a Conservative Chancellor instead of by the people of Scotland. No. Kezia Dugdale. The member will know I have an interest in child poverty. In fact, all the people on this side of the House do. Why then is it that under her government progress has stalled and it went down when Labour were in power? 
Linda Fabiani. Presiding officer, in the last three years of the Labour-led executive, the level of poverty was unchanged despite the unprecedented growth in the budget of the then Scottish executive. If Labour couldn't get to grips with it during the good times, then they must, they must recognise the need to increase the powers of this Parliament. Perhaps the representatives here today of the Labour Party in Scotland will also tell us why they prefer to see the most needy in our society vilified by a Westminster UK Tory Liberal coalition than to give the people of Scotland the opportunity to strengthen our economy, utilise our assets and realise our ambitions for a welfare system that is simpler, makes work pay and lifts people out of poverty. President Officer, the article of faith espoused by those who defend the status quo that a positive future for Scotland's economy depends on our continuing membership of the United Kingdom is redundant. Stability, flexibility and investment, as previously demanded by Alistair Darling, are not words that immediately spring to mind when one looks at the UK's public finances, nor do they spring to mind when one considers the records of current and previous UK governments. Ruth Davison recently on television tried to make political capital out of Scotland's welfare spend exceeding our current oil revenue. Perhaps one of our own team here could follow that up with an apology for the historical Westminster squandering of Scotland's oil wealth. Perhaps they might also explain why the people of Scotland should expect any more benefit from the next 40 years of oil revenue or from our renewable resources if we allow these to remain under Westminster's control. The myths perpetuated about Scotland's seemingly unique inability to look after its own affairs are legend presiding officer. On defence, for example, recent scare stories abound. Nothing, though, about the thousands of defence jobs lost to Scotland under current arrangements. One minute with left. direct defence expenditure running at about half of what Scottish taxpayers contribute each year. Taking the power to switch expenditure away from costly nuclear weapons is the right thing to do. Yeah. And it is not possible to say with honesty that you want to stop Trident whilst campaigning to renew and maintain Scotland's contribution to that immoral system and harbouring weapons of mass destruction. It's clear, presiding officer, there's only one way to give Scottish communities access to their resources, and that's by bringing control of them here to Scotland. I believe in independence for Scotland. I believe in raising our sights and having ambition for our nation and its people. Most of all, I believe it's vital for the people of Scotland to take full responsibility for the decisions about the future of Scotland. That's why I support the motion in the name of the First Minister of Scotland. I now call Lewis MacDonald to be followed by Mark MacDonald. Thank you very much. The SNP's proposition today is clear and straightforward, and so is the alternative. We may have different views about the implications of an independent country or a devolved United Kingdom, but we all understand the choice before us, and we all recognise the process by which the Parliament reaches a view. And that is as it should be, because democratic decision-making requires both a process which is agreed by all parties and a choice which is understood by all who vote. And if MSPs are entitled to those things in this debate today, then surely the Scottish people are entitled to an agreed process and a clear choice on Scotland's future. The Scottish Government proposes to define the process by an act of the Scottish Parliament, although the Scotland Act provides that the Union of the Crowns of Scotland and England is a matter reserved to Westminster, so is the Parliament of the United Kingdom itself. Everyone accepts that under current arrangements, those aspects of the Constitution are reserved to the Parliament of the United Kingdom. There are different legal views, though, on whether a referendum on ending the Union is also, by definition, a reserved matter. But for politicians, as opposed to lawyers, the position is surely perfectly clear. Section 29.3 of the Scotland Act 1998 says that the question whether a, pro the, a provision of an Act of the Scottish Parliament relates to a reserve matter is to be determined by reference to the purpose of the provision, having regard to its effect in all the circumstances. In other words, if the purpose and the potential effect of introducing a bill to hold a referendum are to bring the Union of Scotland with England to an end, then the bill must relate to a reserve matter, and it cannot be enacted here unless the UK Government first modifies 
the list of reserve matters through an order made under Section 30 of the 1998 Act. Now, lawyers can argue the pros and cons of purpose and effect in a court of law, but surely no member of the Scottish National Party in this Parliament or anywhere else could look their constituents in the eye and deny that the purpose of an independence referendum was to end the union of Scotland with England. And if SNP ministers cannot deny that is their purpose, then they cannot reasonably legislate to achieve it without a Section 30 order to provide a legal basis on which the referendum could be held. First Minister. Of, uh, clear process. Wasn't there a clear process in a referendum in the city of Aberdeen? And when will he accept the result? Lewis MacDonald. I'm very glad that uh, the First Minister raises that. He reminded us yesterday that Union Terrace Gardens has been at the very heart of Scotland's third city since the days of Queen Victoria. And indeed, the outgoing SNP-led administration on Aberdeen City Council held a referendum on proposals for development at that very place. And the Gardens referendum was a model of precisely how not to do it, which I believe has important lessons for us all. It was held without the benefit of a legislative framework the Political Party Selections and Referendums Act did not apply. The Electoral Commission had no statutory role. There was no agreement among the major parties on what the rules should be. And all of those drawbacks are precisely what we cannot afford to see repeated on a national scale. Indeed, there was, and the First Minister will know this, no way to restrict campaigning to those who have formally chosen to participate and abide by the rules, as the counting officer reported after the event, and no way that he could limit spending by unregistered bodies, certainly. Kevin Stewart. Donald uh, is rather unfair about the conduct of the referendum, uh, which uh, was carried out by one Crawford Langley, who is one of the, the leading lights in terms of returning officers in this country. Uh, there was agreement from all parties, apart from the Labour Party, and also from those for and against the proposition. What is wrong here is that the Labour Party cannot admit defeat in a referendum. Are they going to do the same in 2014? Let, let me, let me bring the debate very directly back to the parallel between the referendum recently held in Aberdeen and what is currently proposed. In the Aberdeen referendum, the franchise was given to some 16-year-olds and some 17-year-olds because they happened to be on the electoral register and not to others because they were not. And sixth-year pupils that I spoke to could not understand why anyone could think it was fair to give the vote to some people of their age and not to others. And the disturbing thing is that the very same proposition is in the SNP's consultation one and no one left. has yet offered them an explanation. Alex Salmond this week, and he's done it again today, asserted that Labour councillors in Aberdeen should give more weight to the Gardens referendum than to their own democratic mandate from the local electorate. That view is profoundly wrong because local elections are held on a statutory basis under agreed rules with enforceable spending limits while local referendums are not. And that is why today's Press and Journal reports the view of Mr Salmon's old friend Professor Matt Fortrup that Labour's council election victory this month trumped the referendum. Please result. come to a conclusion. The Aberdeen experience emphasises the need for Scotland's next referendum to be held on a sound statutory basis. Ministers must not repeat the mistakes made in the Gardens referendum. It is the Scottish people's democratic right to decide Scotland's future through a process which is supported by all major parties with rules agreed in advance and a single unambiguous question. If so the you must finish, is to Mr. Yourself, respect the process must do so too. Matt McDonald to be followed by Drew Smith. Thank you. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I've been weighing up how best to respond to Lewis MacDonald's comments on the referendum in Aberdeen. I think the best way to do it is, frankly, to just ignore them um, and allow the people to deliver their verdict, as I'm sure the people will continue to do through the letters pages of the Press and Journal and Evening Express, which have been almost unanimously opposed to Labour's actions in Aberdeen. An advert appeared... No, don't be silly. An advert appeared in the Sunday Herald this weekend, Presiding Officer. An advert appeared in the Sunday Herald 
containing a diverse range of voices and individuals from across Scotland's communities, across Scotland's uh, many sectors, voicing their support for independence. Contained within that were a number of individuals from within my own region of North East Scotland, again from a diverse range of individuals from a diverse range of backgrounds. We had from the business community Stuart Spence, the owner of the Marcliffe Hotel in Aberdeen, and Richard Tinto, the managing director of Tinto Architecture in Aberdeen, successful businessmen within the northeast of Scotland, saying they believed Scotland's future was best as an independent country. From within the faith and the community activist area, we had Abdul Latif, a highly respected member of the Muslim community and the Aberdeen Mosque within the North East, saying he believed Scotland's future was best as an independent country. And from a military background, we had Andy Brown, the president of a Boyne Royal British Legion, a war veteran, saying that he felt Scotland's future was best as an independent country. And it was when Andy Brown signed the declaration that it brought to mind my own grandfather, a war veteran of World War II, who fought with the Gordon Highlanders in Burma during that campaign. For those who will read this official report who may not be familiar, the Gordon Highlanders were the regiment scrapped by the Conservatives, uh, destroying some of the fine traditions of that regiment across Scotland, then carried through by the Labour Party, destroying other regiments, and now potentially carried further by Philip Hammond, a disgraceful disregard for Scottish military history being shown by successive United Kingdom governments. My grandfather, although he was a war veteran and a veteran of the British campaign in World War II, was also a believer in Scottish independence. Not because he was ashamed or embarrassed or opposed to what had happened in his past, but because he recognised that what had happened in terms of a shared campaign, in terms of a shared history, could be celebrated as an independent country, and furthermore, that nations would continue to cooperate in the best interests of the international community as independent, mature nations. And that was his belief, his very firm belief, and one of the reasons why he, and I'm sure one of the reasons why Andy Brown support independence, as do a range of other individuals from military backgrounds who have either signed the declaration or have stated their support for independence. Sadly, my grandfather passed away in 2010, did not leave to see me being elected to this parliament, nor did he live to see the start of the Yes campaign. But I know that he would be happy that the Yes campaign has been started, and he would be happy at the range of people who are backing it. Now, I became a father in 2008, and my second child arrived in 2011. The, the arrival of my children has strengthened my belief that we need independence, because I want to build a better Scotland, not just for everybody else's children, but also for my own children. I look at them and I look at the future that is lying ahead of them. I look at what the UK government is doing in so many of the areas, for example, around welfare, around disabilities, and I look at the future of my children, and it makes me anxious and it makes me worried. I believe that a Scotland, an independent Scotland, could be, build a more socially just nation for them. That's why people who believe firmly in social justice, people like Dennis Canavan, are backing independence because they recognise that a socially just future is far more possible as an independent Scotland than remaining anchored to the United Kingdom and the cuts that are being inhibited on us. And I listened to the Labour Party when we spoke about the concept of welfare cuts being undertaken and they said, oh, it's okay, if we come back to power everything will be all right. Just like it was in 1997 when one of the first acts of the Labour government was to slash disability benefits. That, I think, frankly, shows us what social justice means to the Labour Party at a UK level. And I firmly believe, and I firmly believe there are members on those benches who are committed campaigners for social justice. But they must recognise that remaining part of the United Kingdom dilutes that opportunity rather than enhances it. Small nations, presiding officer, there are many small successful nations across our planet and it doesn't behove the anti-independence parties to throw insults, talking about things like the arc of insolvency, to laugh and deride at the trials and tribulations that some of our neighbours have gone through, like Ireland, like Iceland. But you know what? One these, minute left. these small independent nations have encountered difficulties, but they do so and continue to do so and come through them as small independent nations. They weather the storms as independent nations. Yes, as part of the international community, often cooperating together in a range of ways, but they remain 
true to their independent state as independent nations. And we can now see quite clearly the figures demonstrate that these small independent nations are recovering at a much greater rate than the large lumbering beast that is the United Kingdom. We are clear on these benches, presiding officer. Scotland's future is best served when it is held in Scotland's hands. And I campaign for independence because I want to build a better Scotland, a more socially just Scotland, to the honour of the memory of my grandfather and, importantly as well, to secure the future of my children. Thank you. I now call Drew Smith to be followed by Humza Yusuf. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I am grateful to be called in this debate um, and to follow the previous speakers, particularly um, Linda Fabiani, who, if I may say so, um, actually I thought made an impassioned case on the reasons why she believes what she believes. And if only the First Minister had come here today, then we might have had a slightly better tone um, to this debate if he had followed suit. But I want to say at the outset that I respect the position of the SNP on independence for Scotland, even if I disagree with it. It is a legitimate case to argue for a separate Scotland, and I have no fear that a Scotland outside the United Kingdom would not be able to survive. I simply take the view that a Scotland working in partnership with our neighbours could be even more successful. But I said that it is legitimate for separatists to argue their case, but it must be... I, I've only just begun, John, so if you'll forgive me. Um, I said that it is legitimate for, for the separatists to argue their case, but it must be argued. It cannot simply be asserted, as we have heard again uh, at lunchtime today and in this debate. There are serious questions which those who promote, promote the change must be able and prepared to argue. And so far we have seen precious little attempt to do so. The celebrities at the cinema were not keen to answer questions about what independence might mean for Scotland. And as Joanne Lamont said uh, on TV just a few days ago, the Deputy First Minister was unable to answer more questions. Just yesterday, the SNP in this chamber were, un were unable to answer basic questions about how Scotland might have weathered the current Euro, Euro crisis. So it is perhaps one benefit of putting the proposed referendum off that the Scottish Government will have a long time to think about and cobble together some answers to those questions because the people of Scotland are already asking them and I'm afraid for SNP backbenchers the questions are going to keep coming from the people of Scotland. I do think that the delaying of the referendum is a shame but I also welcome that I and other... Uh, uh, sure. Mark MacDonald. Uh, I respect the fact that there will be a need for parties to lay out their policy agenda for what they would do as the government of an independent Scotland. When will the Labour Party start to do that or do they not believe that they will ever govern in an independent Scotland? <laughs> Drew Smith. I, I, I really don't intend to, to, to stand it and set out the policy priorities of... of uh, the Labour Party and Independent Scotland, which I do not believe is going to come into existence. I mean, uh, the, the, argue, the argument that it is incumbent upon us to argue for what we would do uh, uh, after something that we don't believe in comes to but it is just completely illogical. And I do appeal um, to SNP members um, to grow up and to take this debate slightly more seriously. Um, I do think the delaying of the referendum is a shame, but I also welcome the fact that I and other uh, members elected last year will be in the first generation of members of this Parliament who can look forward to a clear answer to the constitutional question one way or, a, or another. Now, all of my life, support for a separate Scotland has hovered at around a third, while support for the SNP has fluctuated. So I don't think that it is very likely that Scotland will choose to leave the United Kingdom, but I don't take that for granted, and we will have to wait and see. However, given my lack of faith in the SNP's prospects, at least not on the strength of their current arguments or assertions, I do think there is an opportunity to ensure that a rejection of separation is not just a negative result for the SNP. This, um, I would prefer to carry on at present, uh, please, Mr Hepburn. Um, the, this debate and the eventual referendum could be an opportunity for Scots to affirm our place in Britain. Given that ordinary people in this country were not asked by the previous Scots Parliament, of which the First Minister is so fond, for their views on the Treaty of Union, the debate could just as much be an opportunity for Scots to democratically join the Union rather than leave it. The Britain of 2012 and of 2014 is a different place to that which was created in 1707, just as the Scotland of today is a different place to the Scotland of 1999. I was a schoolboy when this place was created. All of my adult life, this place has existed and taken decisions, some good and some bad, but decisions taken for Scotland here in Scotland. The Union of today recognises the will of the Scottish people for a Parliament of their own. Home rule within the Union is, in my view, the best of both worlds. Devolution has allowed people who live in Scotland, who, as the First Minister puts it, care most about Scotland, to take decisions. 
This place has led the UK with action on land reform, on smoking free, free tuition, on protecting our NHS from marketisation, on concessionary travel, on personal care, opening railways, creating a national theatre. And to pretend that this Parliament is impotent is to do down all of those achievements. I am proud of devolution and of the role that my party played in delivering it. But I do not think that we on this side should or can sit back. I welcome a debate about powers for this Parliament. The modern call for a Scottish Parliament came out of UCS the destruction of, and the destruction of industries like coal and steel and the communities that relied upon them. It was, much, it was as much about factory closures in the 80s and 90s and the campaigning of the Labour movement as it was emotional or cultural na nationalism. It is true that the world has One turned many times since those issues dominated debate in Scotland, but as someone whose school playground was in the shadow of a shut pit, the story of devolution is not, in my view, finished. The Glasgow I represent today is an uncertain place for many, uh, and, it may be that the change, that it, and it may be that changes in who does what are needed in the future. But much more important is not the question of who does what, but rather what is to be done. And it is this debate that is distracting us from those questions, although I, I completely recognise that the SNP have a mandate um, to put this question. Um, but there is a frustration in Scotland, and there is going to be uh, a continued sense of frustration amongst the people of Scotland, and the SNP are going to need to accept that. Accept Please come that. to a conclusion. Uh, of course, President Officer. The convention scheme that, that created this place was well worked out and understood, and a Scottish Parliament with tax powers was voted for by the people. In contrast, the separation ca case is vague and often vain. The reality is that we can share power and devolve it from Holyrood as well as to it. I'm afraid you must finish. I'm sorry, President Officer. Um, in my view, the campaign for, uh, for Britain is a positive one, and it is one which I believe we will win. Thank you very much. Humza Yusuf to be followed by Annabelle Goldie. Presiding officer, life is uh, often marked by various milestones and it was almost exactly a year ago that I made my maiden speech in this very chamber and the feeling of great honour that I had on that very first occasion has never left me regardless of what the issue uh, was I was speaking on and it's a real privilege to be to contributing to today's uh, historic debate. Presiding officer, another milestone in my life was the Iraq war. It was a catalyst that drove me towards having an interest in politics and led me to where I am today. The members may well suggest that's an unfortunate consequence of a decision made by Tony Blair, but I will leave that for other members to determine. But I remember at the time joining throngs of people from across Scotland to take part in a huge protest against the invasion, with over 30 coaches leaving from Glasgow alone. We joined over 2 million others who took the streets of London to voice our anger at what, is, uh, what was an illegal invasion predicated on a lie. After the protest, I remember at the naive age of 18 thinking that things had to change. Two million people surely can't be ignored, but ignored we were. And it was at that moment that I was fully convinced about independence. Never again should we be in a position where our sons and our daughters' lives are put at risk for a war which goes against the sovereign will of the Scottish people and for which there is no legal basis. I am not saying that a future government in an independent Scotland will not make decisions that I don't agree with. What I am saying is that it's surely better to have the decisions about our children's future by those who care most about their interests. That is the mothers and fathers of Scotland and the people of this nation at large. Of course. Ruth Davidson. I'm interested if the member is making judgments about things happening in Scotland versus things happening in London. Why he was on the march in London when there was a march in Glasgow on the same day? Homsay Yusuf. I, I went to many marches, uh, I'm sure I can, tell, I, can, I can assure the member, in Glasgow and Dundee and Aberdeen uh, and of course in London as well. But, presiding officer, I'm proud to be on that point an international nationalist. I believe Scotland can play an even greater role on the world arena as an independent country. Just observe the huge impact small European countries have already made on the global stage. We only need to hear the words Oslo Accord or Geneva Convention to realise how much of an impression we could really make. Unfortunately, in the current union, Scotland is forced to carry the baggage of the United Kingdom rather than become a beacon of peace, which we aspire her to be. Go to the Middle East and see what deep scars Iraq has left us with. In the subcontinent, the mere mention of Afghanistan evokes a vitriolic response, and we are hardly flavour of the month in Europe, with a Prime Minister more hell-bent on bowing to the pressure of a Eurosceptic backbench just to keep Boris away from number 10 for at least another few years. In contrast, Scotland is respected across the world. As an independent country with the full range of foreign affairs powers, I look forward to the day Scotland stands proudly with the eyes of the world upon us as leader after world leader takes up to sign 
the Glasgow Treaty or Edinburgh Accords, securing a safer and more stable future for generations to come. But moving on, Presiding Officer, the debate about Scotland's future is also about the values we wish to espouse as a nation. Scotland has always had an egalitarian thread interwoven with entrepreneurialism, innovation and enterprise as part of her fabric. The story of Ali Ahmed Aslam, who came to this country in the 1950s as an economic migrant from Pakistan, he then went on to invent chicken tikka masala, of course our nation's favourite dish, by adding a tin of Campbell's tomato soup to a dry curry, and then went on, because of that success, to become a proprietor of one of Glasgow's most successful restaurants, probably sums up all of these values in one go. Presiding Officer, Scotland has been on an incredible journey, particularly over the last 10 years, in which we have been treading a vastly different path to the rest of the United Kingdom. Whether it was the previous Liberal Lab coalition and their introduction of free nursing and personal care, or this Scottish Government with their introduction of free education or keeping the NHS public, we have managed to, I think, entrench social welfare and egalitarianism with the powers that we do have. This is in complete contrast to the political landscape of the UK where a two-tier NHS has been created. Financial barriers to education being erected, a social welfare system created as uh, you're leaving the disabled community living in fear and our civil liberties steadily eroded. The evident truth is that we do do 